Rolling. This is the Fed Sock Films Podcast. Where we continue the conversation sparked, sparked on, on film. film. Quite on set. You want to know what freedom tastes like? It tastes like this beer. Take one. This is, in fact, the classic solution in search of a problem. Action. It cannot help but be controversial. Cut. With expert discussion and analysis. With the greatest legal minds on the topic today. The Fed Sock Films Podcast. It's a wrap. In all the world, there's no place quite like Wyoming. Cowboys, grizzly bears, Old Faithful, and crypto? In 2019, the Wyoming legislature created the Special Purpose Depository Institution, or the Speedy, which is kind of like a bank, only for digital assets such as cryptocurrency. It's a new frontier in financial regulation. Howdy, partner. Welcome back to the FedSoc Films Podcast. I'm Anne Hartley, your bucolic host. We're back with Alexandra Geyser of River Financial to talk about the Regulatory Transparency Project's new film, Bitcoin Cowboys, which looks into Wyoming's unique approach to cryptocurrency regulation. Welcome, Alexandra. Thanks for having me, Anne. It's a delight to have you. Have you ever been to Wyoming? It's not exactly the first place you'd think of when you talked about cryptocurrency and high finance. So I am a Denver native. Uh, So yes, I have been to Wyoming, but more frequently, Wyoming has come to Denver. (laughs) What do you mean by that? It's it's sparsely populated, right? Uh, Denver is is sort of the the big city uh, if you live in Wyoming. So we would, you know, we've driven through it. You go out there; it's a beautiful state. Um, but as a co- it, there's a little bit of a regional rivalry, right? So it's not to the level of Ohio versus Michigan or Texas versus Oklahoma. But you know, as a Colorado native, like yes, hello Wyoming. <laughs> Gotcha. I have really fond memories of the first time I visited Wyoming, and uh, we had a little trouble getting back into our car because there was a big horned sheep that was determined to uh, headbutt one of the uh, mirrors. Oh, no. We to, yeah, we had to uh, sneak around to get back in. It definitely <laughs> made an uh, impression of the Wild West. Yes, I'm sure. Well, I'm glad you made it. Absolutely. So... How did Wyoming end up as a cryptocurrency leader? Wyoming, I think, has done some really smart things on the regulatory front and recognized that cryptocurrency had some potential for for finance, particularly in the 21st century where things are digital. And so what is often difficult as as a cryptocurrency company is the the existing banking regulations. There's a reason that there are fewer banks now in a post Dodd Frank world than there were pre Dodd Frank. It's it's tough work out there. And so you might agree or disagree with any of the regulations, but I think it's a fact that it is difficult to create a bank. And this is doubly true if you're in the cryptocurrency space. Um, And particularly previously, right? So I think I would kind of mark the 2017 bull market as as an important turning point for people's familiarity with and awareness of cryptocurrency. But even even now, um, I think it is still viewed as a little bit um, novel. And so the the banking structure can be really difficult. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but cryptocurrency exchanges and brokerages are regulated state by state as money transmitters. So this allows you to buy and sell or send and receive cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. But it doesn't let you do some of the other activities typically associated with banking. So we might think of uh, making loans as a big one. Um, the SPDI or Speedy is a, a license that allows a company that works with cryptocurrency to take on a lot more functions like a traditional bank, um, but they still can't make loans. And so you sort of neatly sidestep the need for FDIC insurance there because Wyoming requires a one-to-one reserve ratio. So if if I put one Bitcoin into a Wyoming SPDI, 
they can't lend it out. They've got to hold on to it for me. And so as a result, there isn't a run on the bank risk. If I come back and I ask for my one Bitcoin back, they have it right there. They can give it to me. So it's, um, I think it's an interesting sort of mid-step between what we think of as national banks um, that have full sort of full banking powers um, and are regulated by the OCC or the Office of the Controller of the Currency. And then definitely um, several steps up from merely a money transmitter license, which is used by, you know, Western Union, MoneyGram, and, and your friendly local Bitcoin or crypto company. Yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting to hear it explained like that, where it's, it's both a bank and not a bank. Yeah, so I think I would think of it sort of like um, like features on a car, right? So if you go to the dealership, you can get you you've sort of got your model, right? And once you settle on that, well, you can choose: do you want leather seats or cloth seats? Do you want power windows? Do you want just AM FM, or are you getting the full Apple CarPlay? Right? There are some customizable features that you can take on and off that don't change the underlying structure. Banking works like this, or at least banking regulations do. And so for just the send receive portion, you've got money transmitter licenses. If you just want to custody people's assets, um, some states offer a trust charter. Some states give you additional banking powers with the trust charter. That one is varies wildly state to state. Um, If you just want to make loans, there's often a a lending license and there's usually a a sort of safe harbor for lending in each state. Then you've got some states have an additional license for if you just want to offer mortgages to people, you can do that. If you want to do a number of these activities but not make any money doing it, you can be a credit union, right? And then you've got state banks and national banks, both of which have um, a little bit more of a, a full suite of products. And this is all on the retail banking side. Obviously, investment banking has its own set of of permissions, but we're not really getting into that. Um, The Speedy is not going to replace Goldman Sachs anytime soon. That is certainly good to know. (laughs) So Bitcoin Cowboys focuses on how Wyoming approaches crypto regulation with the Speedies that you just talked about. Are other states doing things differently? Yes, this is really an area where you see federalism at work. So my company, River Financial, is regulated as a money transmitter in all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico. The different states have different definitions of what money transmission means. And so there are some states where we don't need a license. Those are our favorite states. Uh, There are other states where we do need a license, so we have one. Or while we are waiting on our license, uh, we don't operate there. So there are two states that fall into that category, Nevada and New York. Uh, And then there are some other states where we got outside counsel to take a look at the statutes and our business plan and determine that we didn't need a license. So those are, that is kind of how federalism works. I can tell you as the director of regulatory affairs at a Bitcoin company, uh, that's a lot of job security for me, right? Uh, You've got a whole lot of different solutions and iterations at the state level. And then you have the ever looming specter of federal regulation uh, at the national level. Gotcha. And how how does that interaction uh, between the state level uh, regulations and the federal regulations work? Yeah, so just like anything else, um, federal regulations can supersede state regulations. So this is something, this is part of why um, the OCC is very powerful, is they can issue a national charter to a bank. Well, that lets, that essentially works like a freeway over all the side streets of the state system, right? And so it's a a much faster and more direct way to get to where you want to go, which is performing banking activity. Um, Otherwise, in if there isn't some sort of superseding federal regulation, states are free to regulate or not regulate as they wish. And so this is something where um, you've had a number of states 
pioneer sandboxes uh, where maybe they suspend one or several regulations and let companies operate in exchange for some information about how that's going. So we operate in Hawaii via a sandbox program there that I think has been very successful. Um, And then you've got, you know, kind of the whole gamut. So Wyoming has wanted to be very open to cryptocurrency. South Dakota has some other pretty favorable regulations. There's a catch, though. Like, those states want your business. They want your people. So typically, you're going to need to have all or a vast majority of your people, your employees, et cetera, in that state. It's a it's a both and, right? Sort of a, a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours situation. But it makes sense. These Western states are often kind of sparsely populated. And so that kind of a system can really work to to everyone's advantage. Um, and so you've kind of got everything in between. New York has been, and you touch on this in the film, New York has been very opposed to cryptocurrency and has instituted something called the bit license. Um, so there you actually need two licenses. You need both a traditional money transmitter license and the virtual currency license that's called the bit license. Um, That means you've got double surety bonds that you need. You need expensive compliance software and certain officers at your company. Uh, My company has been in regulatory limbo for almost a year and a half in New York, which means we have incurred lots of expenses so that we can operate in New York, but haven't been given the green light yet. So there are real, you really see a, a full spectrum of different approaches to the idea of regulation across the 50 states. Do you think it's a good thing, both both talking about people investing in cryptocurrency and also these uh, cryptocurrency firms, is it a good thing for them that the states are acting as uh, laboratories of democracy here? I, th- I think so. I mean, I would say from a business standpoint, it's always easier to follow one set of rules than 50 sets of rules or 55, right? Because <laughs> you've got several federal agencies that uh, would like a piece of the pie. From a from a consumer standpoint, I actually am not sure how much it matters. Um, people, people tend to buy the products that are offered, right? And so if Texas thinks you can offer a lot more products than New York, then Texans will have access to those products. It's still pretty early in the world of cryptocurrency. So I think some of the questions about, you know, which which cryptocurrency is going to win out, is it going to be Bitcoin or Ethereum? You know, my money is on Bitcoin, but there are plenty of other people who disagree. Um, maybe they think the winning cryptocurrency hasn't even been created yet. Um, so you'll sort of see. But I think from my standpoint, I would always like to see my state foster innovation and and really embrace the American spirit. And so from that standpoint, I think what Wyoming has done is really successful in that they have uh, done two things. One, they've actually laid out rules. And two, they've tried to make those rules reasonable and easy to follow. And so one, in actually laying out rules, this is what the federal government isn't doing. And when I say federal government, there are several agencies at work here, or more specifically at, a, at not work here. Um, I think by and large, people are eager to know the rules and operate within them. Uh, certainly, River, my company is. Um, And it can be really frustrating to feel like there's a a sort of Damocles hanging over you, that if you have a great idea and it isn't illegal, you might get in trouble anyway because the SEC decided retroactively that, in fact, it was illegal, right? That, That isn't the rule of law at work. So kudos to Wyoming for actually laying stuff out. And then two, kudos to Wyoming for saying, hey, we'd really like to allow innovation while recognizing we don't want people to lose money. I think that that's um, kind of a, a common sense thing that can sometimes be overlooked. And so there are a handful of, of mechanisms that you can put in place that help prevent losses of money. So um, one of them is the one-to-one reserve ratio that 
Wyoming requires for the SPDI. Um, Another one is surety bonds, which work a little bit like insurance. And so you have them for some amount of money. Uh, The requirements range drastically. But the amazing thing about a surety bond is it actually provides more coverage when there's a downturn in the market right? If Bitcoin is 50 grand, well, if you have a $50,000 surety bond, that's going to cover one Bitcoin for your clients, right? If, however, Bitcoin is somewhere in the 16 grand range like it is today, well, suddenly you're covering not quite four Bitcoin, right? And so the surety bond is is a nice tool, I think, for market downturns, which is historically where people have lost money. It's very easy to make money when there's just money swirling everywhere. Uh, it's when you have those downturns and constrictions in capital that uh, you start to see who who the real businesses are and who the fraudsters are. So it sounds like even for Wyoming, uh, giving these cryptocurrency firms a place to operate doesn't mean giving them free reign to just do whatever they want with no limitations or safeguards. Absolutely. And I'd say even for states that don't require cryptocurrencies to have a, a money transmission license, they're there is some meaningful oversight, right? If you're operating in their jurisdiction, um, maybe maybe they're not collecting data from you, but if you start defrauding their their customers, they're going to have causes of action against you in a criminal sense, right? And so I think that we forget about that, that um, you know, there, there kind of is a, a spectrum and a range. There can be criminal consequences even if there aren't civil penalties for certain behaviors. So the idea that no regulation means no consequences is, a, I think, a, a surprising sort of falsehood to me. Absolutely. So when you look at all these layers of regulation, both with the states and the federal uh, at the federal level, uh, do you think crypto is still the Wild West, like SEC Chairman Gary Gensler said? Absolutely not. He says that all the time and it makes me crazy. Uh, That just isn't true. I would say the money transmission license system is a little bit of a square peg round hole, but it is. It's a square peg that we've all agreed on, right? And so that, again, that offers some predictability and some uniformity that allows a a small company like mine to operate. You know, we were founded in 2019 by two cousins. We're we're the American dream. Uh, We've got about 45 employees. And so a company like River is really is sort of the the young, scrappy, and hungry that I think has always had a place in America and, and has really built it. We're not going out into the OK Corral and just shooting people willy-nilly, right? It's, it's not the Wild West. You have some regulations. Maybe they are not as finely tuned as you would prefer, but but they work and and they're findable, they're followable, right? And this is, again, I think in pretty sharp distinction to the way that Chair Gensler has run the SEC, where he has worked hard to make examples out of, I think, kind of edge cases. Um, Instead of trying to add clarity to the space, offer clarity on the rules, promulgate them through normal APA processes. Um, It's been been frustrating to watch, uh, even as I, I think my company has pretty successfully navigated that. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much for this quick peek into the maybe not so wild, but certainly wonderful world of crypto. Before I let you go, where can our listeners find out more about your work on cryptocurrency? Absolutely. So they can follow me on LinkedIn. I'm Alexandra Harrison Geyser. Harrison is just my middle name. No extra punctuation needed. Uh, Or you can go to river.com and I'm on our about page. Well, thank you for joining us, Alexandra. It's been a real delight. And thank you folks for tuning in. You can find our film Bitcoin Cowboys on our YouTube channel or at fedsoc.org. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot O-R-G. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. That's a wrap. This has been a FedSoc audio production.